Hi, everyone. This is Brent Johnson on behalf of Real Vision, and I'm here with uh, one of my favorite analysts. And it's about the one year anniversary since our last interview, and it's uh, the one and only Russell Napier. Welcome, Russell. Brent, it's good to be back. Was it a year? It seems like five. It seems like a month. I don't know what the last yeah. year felt like, but it's hard to time it, isn't it? it? It was last fall. I don't know the exact date, but we're getting pretty close to a year. And, uh, you know, I have to say, you know, it, it was kind of a re real honor for me to do it because you're, you're one of my favorite uh, guys that I follow and uh, listen to and, and who makes me think about things. And I started off our interview last year with a mistake uh, referring to you as a Scotsman. So I'm not even going to try to, uh, to I'm not even going to try to introduce you today. I'm going to let you introduce yourself. OK, uh, the phrase that you guys use over there is Scots Irish. So I'm from uh, Northern Ireland originally. So uh, uh, but apart from that, in terms of professionally, I've been advising uh, institutional managers now for 25 years. I've been in the business for just over 30. Author now of two books because the new one is out, Asian Financial Crisis. But I also run a course in finance. Uh, I'm really delighted to say that finally that is online and you can take it now through uh, online and videos and questions and put my name and course into the internet and you'll find it. So finally, we can bring the joys and understandings of financial history to the world. And my goodness, do we need them just at the minute, given, given the huge changes underway? Uh, now, I have to tell you that I have probably received more feedback on the interview we did last year than any other interview. Uh, and, and it's been great. Um, and so I know there's a lot of people who've been looking forward uh, to doing this and asking me to do this. And so I appreciate you taking the time. Um, I think what we should do today is I think we should uh, do a little bit of a summary of what we talked about a year ago. Um, and then we'll go through some other things as well. But I would encourage anybody who is watching the, this interview who has not seen that one, I would encourage you to go watch that one prior to watching this one, because I think I think we may refer to a little bit of that that previous interview because we're we're kind of talking about the same topic. We're just further down the road at this point. So um, you can find that on Real Vision as well. But. You know, a long story short, Russell, you were for a very long time one of the more well-known and better spoken deflationists. And about, I don't know, for lack of a better number, 18 months ago, you made the change. And that was kind of shocking for a number of people. And that, that was kind of what led to our discussion. You know, and a year ago uh, when we spoke, you were predicting, you know, at least 4% CPI this year and uh, strong global growth. And, you know, here we are. Uh, CPI is a little above 4%. I think some people would argue it's a lot higher than that. Um, global growth has been pretty good. It's starting to get revised down a little bit. Maybe we talk about that a little bit. But, you know, by and large, your prediction has been correct. So, you know, kudos to you. And um, I think maybe maybe we talk about where we're at now. Sure. Uh, there are two parts to the forecast. The second part actually was more important than the first one. So the part, first part was inflation would hit four and above and interest rates wouldn't go up. Uh, ultimately, the second one is more important because it's why interest rates haven't gone up. So I'm sure we'll come back to that, but let's remember that's the fundamental call here, that we've kind of severed that link through administrative measures. Uh, in terms of the inflation call, that was all about the supply of money, which had a huge rise into a recession, which is incredibly rare. In fact, I can't think of another one. And in my opinion, was caused by government interference in the commercial banking system that forced, cajoled, or persuaded these banks to expand their balance sheets into a recession, once again, very rare. Uh, and that money is still sitting there. It's not really been used very much so far. And the key thing now uh, going forward is to expand their balance sheets into a recession, once again, very rare. Uh, and that money is still sitting there. It's not really been used very much so far. And the key thing now uh, going forward is, will it be used? Uh, historically, you'd be looking at a couple of year time lag between that money being created and affecting inflation. Uh, and here we are uh, a year and a half later, and it's already affecting it. So uh, I know everyone likes to think, well, there's supply side problems here. They'll be fixed. Inflation will come down. I, I tend to think the supply side problems will indeed be fixed. Uh, but behind it, there is all that money that was created. And then the crucial thing is, where, what is the level of money creation now by these commercial banks? And uh, I often get criticized for being too long term. But if we just uh, if I go to the other extreme and be overly short term, if we take the, the growth in U.S. bank balance sheets in September and annualize that, they're growing at nearly 13 percent per annum. Now, that's not loan growth. It's credit growth. And that includes securities. Uh, but the more I look at the world and the need for massive capital expenditure for all sorts of things, 
uh, the more I can see, yeah, absolutely, commercial bank balance sheets will be growing at double digit levels. So will money supply and therefore inflation between four and six is, is perfectly normal and sustainable going forward. And then the key question is, what on earth are they going to do about interest rates? Because there is no way that interest rates can be allowed to reflect that level of inflation. So I, I would say the update uh, is that we actually haven't begun to see the impact of the money that was created or it's only started. And the current run rate of bank credit growth, not loan growth, but credit growth, suggests to me that this is going to continue. But uh, what's going to happen to interest rates? How do we keep them down when inflation is high? That's what everybody needs to know if they're trying to preserve wealth in the, in the type of world we're moving into. Well, I think that's kind of the perfect intro to kind of the first topic that I want to kind of address. And it's really kind of the centerpiece, at least that, as I see it, of, of your thesis, and that is financial repression. And so we have, and you're predicting, we'll continue to have inflation, but interest rates not rising to reflect it. And that's kind of the definition of financial refresh, refreshing, repression. Um, I think maybe this is a good time to just quickly revisit your term that you use, which is cap day. Uh, you've talked about cap day and cap day is coming. So how about just a quick revision of, or a revisit to what cap day actually is? Because it's related to this financial rep repression. Sure. So my job is to speak to professional investors. I would say it's two thirds of them probably still believe in transitory inflation. So if the owners of government bonds or a lot of them still believe in transitory inflation, there are some of them who think that these yields compensate them for inflation because they think inflation is coming back down. Now, if they change their minds, are they buyers or sellers of bonds? Well, given where inflation is and given where yields are, they're likely to be sellers. So we're all sitting here waiting for the taper. We're all sitting here waiting for the central bank, any central bank, to begin to shrink its balance sheet. But if suddenly everyone's a seller of government bonds, and if those yields are rising to a level which are too dangerous uh, for the private sector in particular, then the central bank balance sheet would have to start expanding even more rapidly. So here we all are believing in inflation, and the, this would force the central bank to do three things in the face of rising inflation. Keep the short rate down, keep the long rate round and, down, and accelerate the growth of its balance sheet. So that they're not going to do that. That is so incredibly dangerous uh, that they really wouldn't do it. They'd run a very pro-inflationary pro policy in a time when we all believe in inflation. So cap day is when we have to get somebody else to hold down the yields because the rising yields, or the rising nominal yields are just far too dangerous for a highly geared economy. Uh, and cap day means forcing savings institutions to buy those bonds and keep those yields down, much as we did, uh, much as we do when we're involved in, in warfare. That's how you finance uh, warfare. And that's where we're going to. The, the levels of total debt to GDP in the global economy are higher than they were during World War II. Uh, maybe not government debt, but total debt to GDP is higher. So we'll be going into the sort of the type of financing you have during warfare, where the financial institution where you have your savings will be forced to buy government bonds at these low, low yields. So that's cap day. And the reason it's so important for an investor is if you're going to force an institution to buy something, you're going to force them to sell something. And if you look at the portfolio of institutional investors, the most likely liquid thing to sell is equities. So phase one of this, which we've all lived through now for actually a very long period of time, is incredibly bullish for equities. Central bank creates liquidity to depress the discount rate and the growth rate goes up, equities do very well. So cap day is important because it's that day when we suddenly have to get someone else to do it and it triggers them into being long-term liquidators of equities. I mean, I'd say 10 years to 15 years. Uh, that's not to say you can't make money in equities, but you better be a good stock picker if you're going to do it. Got it. Well, so, okay, so now that we have the, uh, you know, the, 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 the framework of what cap day is, I guess now the question, because it, I understand what it is, and I, I tend to agree with everything that you've just said. That that's kind of the plan. But when does when do you think it kicks off? Because so far it hasn't kicked off. Maybe it's kicked off in a few places, but it hasn't kind of become the norm. So I guess my question to you is, and you don't have to have a time, you don't have to make a prediction, but do you have an idea of when this kicks off? Yeah. So obviously I've been doing this for quite a long time, and giving you a time <laughs> would be uh, you know foolish probably. So let me give you the indicators. I think that's all you do. You, you kind of. In a situation like this, you have to create a dashboard of indicators that you look at to tell you when the time is coming. The, the easiest one and the obvious one is central bank balance sheets themselves. Now, if they can genuinely begin to taper and rates aren't, sh and rates aren't shooting up, either their support from the bond market disappears and rates don't shoot up, well, that's nirvana for them. I, I don't see why that would happen, but you know that's nirvana. 
we don't have to go to cap day for, for whatever reason. Maybe the existing level of repression is sufficient. Uh, you, the central bank, are not expanding your balance sheet and bond yields are not going up. When that comes to pass, that's, that's wonderful. So the, the number one indicator to be very concerned is if suddenly this growth in balance sheet suddenly just tips, that the pace of growth uh, suddenly goes up, because that's telling you that the central bank is no longer in control of their balance sheet. Remember, quantitative easing is I tell you how much I'm going to buy a month in advance and then I buy it. Yield curve control is where I say I'm going to buy everything in a certain yield and then you sell it to me. So suddenly you're in control. The seller is in control of the pace of balance sheet expansion. So we've got to watch for any of those tips up. Uh, the only place where they look to me that sometimes it tends month to month, but, but the, the ECB does occasionally seem to be tempted by this. If I show you the growth in the balance sheet of other central banks, it is fairly smooth, suggesting that they're in control. But the ECB, there's occasionally months where it goes up much more quickly. So it's too early to say that that's what they're involved with. But if you saw a couple of months where that, that steepness came in, that would be the number one indicator that they really have to hand this off to somebody else because that degree of liquidity creation is A, dangerous, but particularly dangerous because it's a response to more inflationary fears because that's why they're having to cap the uh, cap the bond yield. So I'm watching those uh, very carefully. And the other things you can watch, I obviously, and we've discussed already, watch commercial bank balance sheet expansion because I think there's a lot of money being created there. I think that will probably accelerate. And ultimately, you can't hold the yield curve or you can't also add high powered liquidity into that growth in broad money, which is what you would do if your central bank balance sheet's expanding. So there are other things we can watch, simple things like inflation, inflation expectations, bond yields, uh, but have a key, I would keep a close eye on those two. Uh, at the minute, I would say we I don't see anything flashing red for danger, but this can really change very quickly, uh, given where we are with inflation expectations. I mean, the market, in my opinion, is way behind on inflation expectations and is in for a nasty shock. So things could change quickly. So I haven't given you a time, but I've kind of given you that dashboard that we should all be all be looking at. And at the minute, we're still in the bullish phase for equities, in my opinion. Well, okay, so for, for, for the people who maybe are not familiar uh, with how this would work, how would they institute cap day? How would they make savings institutions or investment managers or pension? How would they make someone buy the bonds? How does it, what is, that, is that a political decision or is that a central bank decision or both? Well, it, it has to be from the regulator. I mean, it's the regulator who ultimately controls what the regulated financial institutions do. And the regulated ultimately is controlled by the politicians, not by the not by the right. central banker. So it is interesting because I'm saying to you that the government ultimately will control the growth in commercial bank balance sheet and money supply. And the regulator will ultimately control the yield curve, which begs the obvious question, what on earth are the central bankers going to do all day? Well, no doubt they'll be writing lots of learned papers, but there's not much else for them to do. I mean, if the, uh, if the regulator controls the yield curve and the government controls the supply of money, that's the price of money and the quantity of money controlled by somebody other than the central bank. You know, I, I think this is all happening. And yet every time I you know, look in the front page of the newspapers, they're telling me about central bankers and how important they are. Uh, they're effectively impotent. So the regulator just passes laws saying, look, I mean, investment is an incredibly dangerous thing. We think you should own the risk-free asset and we think you should own it in size 50% uh, of the portfolio in government bonds, please. I mean, it can be as simple as that. And it is interesting. If, I, if we go back to the last uh, repression around World War II and after, it was actually more difficult to do repression then because you've got to remember that in those days, the bulk of liquid assets were actually held in the hands of individuals, not in the hands of institutions. But the, the great growth in the institutional investment business means that most assets now actually are owned by regulated financial institutions. And it's really very easy to tell them what to buy. I, I can't men mention the name of the clients, but some of my clients are life companies and insurance companies. And when I talk about this, they say, why are you talking about this? We've been forced into this for years. For years, we've been forced to own these government bonds and we think they're dreadful investors. This, this financial repression has been going on for a long time. Uh, and it has if you're in that business, but it can filter down now through into other regulated financial institutions and force more of that money. Uh, in the government bonds. So that's the interesting thing about it. And that's pretty good for an investor in terms of timing because the regulator rarely moves with stealth. Uh, the central bank might stealthily put rates up one night and surprise you, but but you know the regulator takes a while to get going. The legislature takes a while to get going. And uh, I think it's important, Brent, because I think there are some legislatures which are easier to this than others. And uh, you know, given the uh, I don't know what the right word is, the, 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 the disagreements that uh, plague Congress, it, you know, it, it would be pretty visible that this was coming and there'll be a long argument about it. And it may only be in response to a crisis and the crisis would be a spike in bond yields. 
So as an investor, you would get some warning of this, I think, because it has to come from the regulator slash legislature and not, uh, not the central bank. So I think this is a this is an interesting topic you just brought up because what yeah, I think you were just referring to there was the Congress, meaning the U.S. Congress. But you know, I, I want to point out to investors, I mean, to to the audience, because we Real Vision has an audience from all over the world. And when when you're talking about your thesis, your your thesis isn't necessarily a European thesis or a United States thesis. It's a global thesis. Yeah. That, that's and really, really important, you know, because a lot of people think that America is in a worse position than the rest of the world, and it isn't. It, it absolutely isn't. I mean, there are two things you can look at to see who has to get into this situation. One would be the total debt to GDP ratio, uh, and the other would be the private sector debt service ratio, uh, because that would tell you roughly where rising interest rates are just too dangerous because they threaten to bankrupt the private sector. The private sector wouldn't be able to meet the interest payments. And America's in a better con better position than many countries. It's much better than China, much better than France, uh, much better than Belgium, the Netherlands, Canada, uh, Norway. So everyone's in this situation. Everyone's got too much debt. Everyone will have to financially repress at some stage. But to me, America's going to be further down the queue than China, than Europe. Uh, and therefore, the dollar would actually be strong in this environment. They, I think the fascinating thing about this, I see financial repression as the creation of a whole new global monetary system. And we haven't seen one of those formally done since, uh, well, one of those ended with the end of Bretton Woods in 71 and was created with Bretton Woods in 44. Uh, I argue strongly that the devaluation of the Chinese exchange rate created one in, in 94. But the bottom line is they were everybody was impacted at the same time, 44, 71, 94. This one is going to be coming at different times to different people. Uh, and if you're involved in markets, that is a hugely important thing. If we move to a system uh, it not uh, kind of in sequence rather than all at the same time, and particularly for exchange rates. So anybody who moves to this repression should see massive capital outflow. To the extent that capital outflow is permitted, it should leave. There is no way you would leave your capital in a country where the government is determined to force it into bonds yielding less than the rate of inflation. So capital would leave. So you, know, you raise a really important question, because I think particularly if you're looking at it from an American perspective, it's easy to believe that this is a unique American problem. And it absolutely isn't. And America's probably at the back of the queue to implement policies like this. First of all, I, I completely agree with what you're saying. And I think this is an important point, and I'm, I'm going to kind of pound the table on a little bit, because I think this is one of the key things to for people to consider is that when you're when you're listening to this conversation and when you're talking about financial repression and you're talking about inflation or deflation, I think the first thing you have to remember is which currency are you talking about or in which currency are you denominated and in which country do you reside? Uh, because while it's a global phenomenon and, and I agree with you, it's probably going to to happen kind of all over the world. Um, you could have inflation in one currency while being having deflationary pressures in another currency especially if your funding currency is dollars. Um, but the other thing is that, you know, what you mentioned earlier is that to a certain extent, this is a political decision. And, you know, in some countries, just based on the type of uh, government they have, these types of decisions can be made quicker and easier, faster, more dramatic than in others. And so I do think that there will be a sequence. And I think it's a, that, will, that will then have knock-on effects for everything else. So... Again, I'm not asking you to make a prediction, and I know you just said that the U.S. is kind of maybe at the back of the queue, but do, do you have an idea of how you think the sequence might go, or, do, or is there a certain place where you think it perhaps kicks off first? Yeah, I think the sequence is China, actually China first. Now, people watching this will say, well, wait a minute, China's been financially repressing people since before the Second World War, which is true. Uh, some of that repression has lifted in recent years, but you make a very good point. China's not generating lots of inflation. I mean, it is in the PPI, but certainly not in the CPI. And if you look at their monetary policy, it looks tight. I, uh, you know, I can theoretically forecast what's tight monetary policy, but, you know, let's be honest here. People are going bankrupt. That's a pretty tight monetary policy. Uh, that's what's happening in China as we, as we sit here and discuss this. China needs easier monetary policy, not tighter monetary policy. And actually, once again, as we sit here, it's getting tighter monetary policy. Uh, through the markets, and that is the markets are charging more for uh, Chinese companies to borrow dollars at the minute. But I'd be very surprised if they weren't charging more for key people 
to borrow in renminbi as well. So there's a place that's getting tighter monetary policy, but has a debt to GDP level the same as America and has a private sector debt service ratio much, much higher than the United States of America because its interest rates are much higher than the United States of America. So in terms of uh, you know sorting this out, inflating debts away, and, th and that's what financial repression is. I think it's China that have to move first. But here's the problem, the big problem. China runs a managed exchange rate. It doesn't run a free float. Any country that wants to move to financial repression, as we saw from 2009 to 2019, there are two bits of this. You've got to bring your interest rates down and you've got to get your inflation up. Now, how do you possibly achieve that with a managed exchange rate? So my conclusion is that China has to go first. And that, in terms of what we do for a living and try to invest our money, the key manifestation of that is a much weaker Chinese exchange rate as eventually, and this is the problem we don't know when, uh, Xi Jinping has to just cut rates and print money because this is beginning to uh, cascade through his credit system. There are those who believe he can do controlled explosions in the credit system and benefit from the, the assets that that would catapult into the arms of the state. Uh, I don't have any confidence that this can be a series of controlled explosions. I think that credit systems aren't like that. Uh, particularly because he's got this large private sector credit system, which nobody really understands. So I'd put China first and Europe second. And maybe we can come on to, to Europe. But I think, you know, we look at this as a property problem for China, but it's ultimately going to be an exchange rate problem for China. Yeah, it really. And so, you know, I think the other thing to think about, uh, and I'd like to get your, your thoughts on this, because it because I think that you think this, but I, I don't want to put words in your mouth. I, I want, I, I'd like to get confirmation is that while you have moved from the deflationary camp into the inflationary camp, you have said there could be some things along the way that could cause, you know, deflationary forces to show up for a period of time. And if, if China is dealing with a deflationary problem internally, the whole point of you know, releasing the valve on the currency would be to bring inflationary pressures into China to kind of offset those deflationary forces. But in bringing those inflationary forces into China, you're pushing deflationary forces to the rest of the world. Yeah, so I, I have been saying this about China since before COVID, that when I was a deflationist, one of the reasons I was a deflationist is exactly because of this. And I didn't know when this tight monetary policy which I forecast in theory would actually hit the ground in practice, but here we are, it's happening now. So I made the forecast for inflation and, and full knowledge that this could happen. You're right. I mean, a decline in the Chinese exchange rate. And, you know, I've, I've, I've written this book about the consequences of decline in the last Chinese exchange rate because the Asian financial crisis was very clearly, there were many things that triggered it, but one of them was the devaluation of the renminbi and the deflation it brought on undermining other people's external accounts. So, of course, the market will just look at it and go deflation. I think it's wrong, and I'm not saying they won't. Market won't try to price in deflation if China moves in the exchange rate, but I think there are so many reasons why why they're wrong. Uh, let's begin at the beginning. After the last deval, China was mobilizing at least tens of millions of people every year. It was probably tens of millions of people every quarter. Actually, it was mobilizing and bringing into the workforce. Now that process is probably not absolutely complete, but it's largely complete in China. So. Massive resource uh, reutilization uh, isn't going to happen the way it did last time. So that was a, you know, the, the currency fall may have been deflationary, but there was something else going on as well, which won't go on this time. Most importantly, the world did nothing to China when it devalued the exchange rate. And uh, because it was a tiny economy uh, and a tiny export economy, didn't make anything that anybody was particularly buying in 1994. And that's not where we are today. There is no way the world could cope with a major uh, decline in the Chinese exchange rate, which then started popping up in major declines in, in the price of manufactured goods, for instance. So you might think, well, wouldn't it be good to bring down the rate of inflation? Well, no, because of what it would be doing for jobs across the world if that happens. So I think there'd be a political reaction to it, which would be number two. Uh, number three, as, we've, as you've just said, the reason this is happening is because he's printing a lot of money. And, uh, you know, that takes a while, but eventually that begins to feed through in, in more global inflation because China itself has got higher rates of inflation. And I think the fourth one, which is really important for stock pickers, uh, it's just going to be something else that triggers one of the big, biggest capital expenditure booms that the developed world has ever seen. There are just so many trends coming together for a big CapEx boom, whether it's 
not buying as much stuff from China, whether it's building more capacity that is green, whether it's shortening supply lines, whether it's putting more capital in to offset rising cost of labor. Uh, 32, 32 years I've been doing this, and I would say to you, I've never really seen a very large developed world tangible asset investment boom, because it was all happening in China. So if we see it now, if that's what China unleashes, it's it's clearly more inflationary than deflationary. Ultimately, it may create that extra capacity, which helps tame inflation. But in the ver in the first five years of that, particularly if it's financed by banks, then you will see uh, you know a lot of inflation. So that's the argument as to why absolutely the market will panic and price in deflation the day that happens. But it's another good reason, I think, for the long term investor to be putting money to work to benefit from inflation. Well, I think I think it, it could almost be like another COVID as far as the markets are concerned. You could have two or three weeks, maybe a month of these massive deflationary forces. But to your point, um, the world will react with inflationary policies. Global global monetary authorities will do it. Governments will do it. And so we could have a very you know a 1987 or a 2020 type scenario where you get a couple of weeks of just absolute deflationary scare, but then, you know, to your point, it, it ends in inflation. Yeah, and it's another good point, actually. I think I'm sure you're right. I'm sure the central banks would develop world central banks would massively overreact react to this. And my analysis is correct. It's going to be inflationary anyway. But they'll yeah. probably just look at the markets and say, you know, the markets are always right. Let's print even more money. And uh, it would be the worst possible time to do that. But uh, it's something they're quite capable of doing. Well, so then let's talk a little bit, and I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to put you on the spot and ask you to make uh, predictions. But one of the things we didn't talk about last time was really how do investors allocate for this? You know, we, we've mentioned a little bit that you know bonds are going to be capped to their yield as a result to buy bonds. You might have to sell some equities, you know, to, to finance your bond purchases. Typically, with inflationary uh, scenarios, you get commodities rising. But how would you just in general, how would you suggest that people who are watching audience members? And again, I know everybody has their own specific situation, but do you have a kind of just kind of a generalized recommendation on how people kind of navigate this process? Sure. So, as I said, there should be downward pressure on equities in aggregate. But within the equity asset class, which is huge and has a vast range of companies within it, there should be really big beneficiaries from this. To state the fairly obvious, the large market capitalization stocks on the market today are must have been beneficiaries of disinflation. Otherwise, they wouldn't have become large market capitalization stocks. Uh, and those who are large or very small market capitalization stocks are probably people who haven't benefited from inflation, given we've been in a 40 year uh, disinflation. So you should be looking at, at those types of those types of companies. Uh, and those types of companies have been shunned and are basically what some people might call old economy stocks. There are certainly companies with large assets and fixed assets and tangible assets. Uh, and these tend have been historically the biggest beneficiaries uh, from rising inflation because of the nature of the fixed costs, uh, which is uh, depreciation. You get certainly not a number of years in which your earnings are going up quite well if your depreciation is just going sideways or your interest expense, which you may have fixed to match with your duration of your assets, uh, doesn't go up because it's you know, 10, 15, 20 year uh, duration. Those are the types of companies that benefit. Uh, remember, I said the reason that equities go down is they're forced sellers. Well, maybe there are some stocks in that market that aren't owned by institutional investors, you know, that haven't seen an institutional investor cross their threshold in, in many years. That takes you back to a famous book by, uh, by Peter Lynch called One Up in Wall Street. And, and trying to find those stocks. So I'm not sure that the average retail investor can go out and find those stocks. Uh, but there have to be fund managers that can do that. And of course, they tend to have the name value against them rather than growth. And, that, and that, I'm not saying that everything in this value bucket is a buy. But of the type of stocks I'm just describing have done so badly that they tend now to be in that value bucket. And uh, generally speaking, I, I also like to look at Japan as a real beneficiary of inflation as to when it comes back. So, so selected equities, but not the equity aggregates uh, of the type I've just mentioned. And uh, I do make a case for gold regularly. Uh, I, I, you know, it currently stands in the long shadow of Bitcoin, but that won't last much longer, given that the regulators are, are finally getting together to do something about uh, competition to their currencies. You know, we, we talk about financial repression here, which is really moving wealth away from one set of society, savers to debtors. You can't do it. 
unless you control the supply of money. This is the worst possible time to allow a private sector currency to develop because it would strip from you the power to reallocate wealth. Uh, so I know why everybody who owns crypto wants this thing because they, they're against the government doing that. Uh, but it's a battle or it's a war and you have to work out whether you're going to win or not. And I'm pretty confident that governments win this one. Right or wrongly, they'll win this. This is not the time for them to give up control over the supply of money. I'm, I'm arguing exactly the reverse. They've just upped their control over the supply of money because they want to redistribute wealth. Uh, uh, they're not going to permit crypto. So therefore, gold is the beneficiary of, of that attempt to uh, to inflate away wealth. So do you think gold in all currencies, including U.S. dollars, or do you or do you prefer it in other currencies more than other other? Or no, I, I or prefer it. In, well, I, I mean, I'm, I think the dollar will go up, but I think the gold can go up even relative to the dollar. People will tell me that if the dollar is going up, then inflation is coming down, and gold will go down. Yeah, that's the old cycle that we've witnessed for thirty odd years. Yeah. The crucial thing is we're not talking about a cycle here. We're talking about a whole new structure of how the world works. It's like sitting in 1968 and saying, you know, let's call the business cycle. All you had to call in 1968 is there wouldn't be Bretton Woods in 1971. That was it. Now, if you got that one structural call right, uh, you could forget all the other all the other cyclical calls. So there's a big structural call here. We're moving to repression by gold. And all the stuff that you look at from a cyclical perspective, the dollar's going up bad for gold. These things hold much, much less sway if we're really going into that big structural change. I might be wrong on that. If I'm wrong, that'll be wrong on a lot of things. But if, if this structural change is coming, you just buy gold and you hold it. I agree. I agree. So uh, you touched on something else that I, I want to kind of come back to and kind of kind of hammer the table on a little bit, because this is the question I get the most. And and I, I would like to get your, your explanations for it, is that the typical person that I talk to, well, I guess I should say I typically get labeled in the deflation camp. Partly that's thanks to you because you you helped me understand the deflationary forces. Um, but then also because I believe the dollar is going to get stronger. That typically, like you said, for 30 years meant that, that we were in a deflationary environment. Mm. But I believe very strongly that we can have an inflationary environment alongside a rising dollar. Um, and, 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 I, and since you believe that the dollar is going to get stronger and you've called for inflation, can you just, just in, I guess, a couple sentences or, or just a, in a couple paragraphs, explain how you think that happens? Because the average person just assumes my cost of living is going up, therefore the dollar is losing value. Sure, but it's, uh, you know, it's a relative competition in an, in an ugly game as to who's less ugly. I mean, that's what exchange rates are. So if I'm right and China goes first, and that would mean a fall in the currency, the dollar is obviously going up, right? Uh, it doesn't change the rate of inflation in, in uh, America, particularly if we put tariffs on China. If uh, Europe gets into financial repression and capital flows out of Europe and hits the dollar, then the dollar goes up. Now, that it does, it, it does reduce the price of uh, imports, or it can reduce the price of imports. But it doesn't change the nature of money creation in America itself, which has been high and, and will be high and will generate inflation. And historically, because this was all going in a cycle, these things kind of all added up to zero, if you like, and dollar goes up, inflation comes down. But that's not the world that we're living in anymore. We're living in a world where governments have seized the power to create money, where regulators might seize the power to determine long-term interest rates. In, in that world, the old cycle, which was a world of, if you like, theoretically anyway, independent central bankers adjusting interest rates, that world's over. So of course you can get the dollar going up and inflation going up because we, we're not in Kansas anymore. That hits a little close to home. I, I, I went to college in Kansas, so uh, I feel very apropos. Well, okay, so there's something else that, that, that you have said in the last year. I don't remember exactly when you said it, but I remember you said something to the effect that uh, you know investment banks and investment managers should fire all their you know developed market managers and hire EM market managers. So, and basically because you're saying that all countries, even developed countries, are now moving into these types of policies that typically the emerging markets have run, right? Um, so uh, the question I have for you, and, and I'm going to try to make this point in a way that allow you to explain it. In the, It's kind of a complicated point, but I, I want to get your thoughts on this because are you meaning that you, they should hire investment managers with the emerging markets experience because that's where you think people should allocate their money to emerging markets? 
Or is it that you think the developed markets are now going to act like emerging markets, so hire EM managers to manage normal major markets? So I, I didn't go to business school. Well, I'm a lawyer by, by, by trade. Uh, sorry, I shouldn't say by trade, by qualification, because I never actually traded in the, in the law whatsoever. But I believe if you go to business school, they teach you that there is a link between the discount rate and the growth rate or the discount rate and in inflation, because people who, are, who own bonds will always price in some compensation for the rate of inflation. Now, that is so fundamental to the whole way of thinking that everything else basically backs out of that. And of course, our entire discussion is that's over. So therefore, perhaps everything you learned at business school isn't true anymore. So what are you going to do about it? Well, one of the ways to do it is obviously read financial history. And that's why I'm recommending people take my course, which is now online. Uh, they can find it under my name and course. Uh, but the other way you could do it is find a fund manager, an individual who has managed money in a jurisdiction where that's already true and where these administrative measures are in place to make it true and where that's involved political interference in the market to make it true and where it's involved political corruption to make it true and where it's involved credit controls and capital controls to make it true and someone who's already actually done it. Now, if you want to do that in, uh, uh, in a developed world market, you've got to find someone who was around before 1978 because that's when we, at least in the United Kingdom, scrapped capital controls. Or I used to say one could hire a Brazilian or a South African and say, you know, let's say we're a team of five managing an equity portfolio. I would love to have a Brazilian or a South African as one of the four of the five and say, you know what, you see this thing over here? And, you know, that looks entirely innocuous, but actually this is what it means. This is what it, this is the path. You know, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. I think a South African or Brazilian can see the path that we're, Heading down, and you know, it's 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 kind of part of my job as a professional is to shake people up and make them think, and it was really aimed at making them think. Uh, but I would say very strongly that unless you've lived in a regime like this, you don't really know how to cope with it. And the good thing is there are people who've done that, and we can learn from them. So why shouldn't we uh, learn from them uh, and put a few of those in the developed world team? So if we've got a, 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 a situation where the entire world has to do quote unquote cap day. And we've got a world where all governments, regardless of how um, strict or liberal are in effect doing the same thing, it's just a matter of degree. Uh, but we believe there's going to be a sequence, um, you know, where maybe some countries need to do this quicker, some countries it's easier for them to do this quicker. Where, and I know you've said that this is, is good for the dollar, do you still, and it, you know, if the dollar gets stronger, then it means these other countries, they have to print even more to, to cope with the deflationary <laughs> effects of being funded in dollars, right? Yeah, it gets you into a very nasty position and you have to do something about it. I mean, basically, what we're, I think what you're trying to get to is, don't you get runaway completely out of control inflation? I mean, how, that, how on earth can you control inflation if you're not prepared to, to use interest rates? So I want to read you something from another book, not my book, but this, I mean, I'm sure this sits beside your bedside as it sits beside mine, uh, Brent, as one of the great classics of investment. But uh, so this is 1971 in the United States of America. The president is, is, uh, is Richard Nixon. So he's not exactly a, a kind of left wing interventionist. Uh, right. And this is what happens uh, af after, uh, after we leave the gold standard, after America has to go to more repressionary standards. Uh, he introduced price controls and price freezes. That's what happens in 1971. The, and I'll read because I think this is quite entertaining, apart from being illustrative. The reason why price controls administered by bureaucrats provide a poor substitute for the market was soon evident. The Cost of Living Council, which was created to administer these controls, was called on to respond to 50,000 complaints, 6,000 requests for waivers, and 750,000 requests for interpretation in its first 90 days. Among the compelling issues to be decided by the Cost of Living Council and the Office of Emergency Preparedness was whether the University of South Carolina could raise its reserved seat ticket prices by 50 cents for the 1971 football season. A special temporary emergency court of appeals ruled that it could not. So this is why this is so important, because if they're not prepared to use the tool that we're talking about, interest rates, you end up using nonsense like that. And that was 1971. So how successful was that at containing U.S. inflation? Well, so successful that in 1974, 
we had to come up with this. So this is a whip inflation now badge, which was issued by <laughs> Gerald Ford in the Ford administration. And once again, for exactly the same reason, they weren't prepared to use interest rates to combat inflation. So they decided to have a great big drive to, con to convince the public to combat inflation. This one, I think, is quite amusing because this one was issued by Swanson's Frozen Foods, the <laughs> inventor of the TV dinner and the greatest company ever to come out of Omaha, Nebraska. Well, maybe right. second best ever to come out of Omaha, Nebraska. So the question you're asking is really good and, and, and really, really, really important because if you don't use interest rates to do this, you start slipping, your whole economy starts slipping away from a market economy toward more, towards more like a command economy. And if Richard Nixon could do it, then anybody can do it. And, you know, I've I, I mentioned this before, but do you know who ran that, that commission that uh, Nixon set up to control prices? The man he put know. in charge of running the Cost of Living Council was called Donald Rumsfeld. Ah, uh, and good. because of all these requests coming in, he was so busy that he hired a number two, and his name was Dick Cheney. Now, if Ronald Rumsfeld, Dick Cheney, and Richard Nixon can get together to to launch a price fixing mechanism for the entire American economy, it tells you what can happen if you absolutely not prepared to use interest rates. So, I think the good news for America is the Fed will begin to do something, but it can't do very much. But at least it can do more than China, and it can do more than, than Europe. So when I talk about financial repression, people go, get it. Inflation here, interest rates here, let's talk about something else. But this is the ailment, the side effect that begins to permeate through an economy when you're not prepared to use interest rates to control inflation. Well, let's, let's dig into this a little bit deeper here, because I think it's my experience is that when you start talking about inflation, uh, and especially when you see a, a spike in inflation, such as we've seen for the last call it 12 months, you inevitably get the conversations of Weimar, of Venezuela, hyperinflation, for lack of a better word. And I think I, I'm someone who thinks that's something that you should understand and how it happens, but I think it gets way overused because hyperinflations are actually extremely rare. Um, doesn't mean they can't happen, but uh, the, 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 the term is to be, it gets used so often that to me, the term has lost its meaning a little bit. Yeah. But let's talk a little bit about how it does happen. Um, because if, if you are one of these countries where you, let's say that, you know, you are funding in dollars and you're printing in your local currency and you've got cap day and you, your populace is taking their currency out and investing it abroad because, you, like you said, the last thing you want to do is, is leave your money in the country where you're being financially repressed. To me, that's the formula for hyperinflation. Uh, but is there, some, is there some part of this that I'm missing or some other part that, that I mean, and obviously the, the faith in the currency gets lost and that's when you really get the hyperinflation. But is there some other thing that is done from a policy perspective that, that really contributes to this? Yeah, so uh, the, th the, the, the academic definition of inflation, I think, is 60% per month of hyperinflation. So you better remember it's pretty excessive if we, if we want to use that word. Uh, for most of the period post-World War II, British inflation oscillated between about 4 and 20. Uh, and that was very successful at destroying the British debt burden. So we didn't need to get to 50% per month or hyperinflation. 20 was pretty painful, believe me. Uh, but it wasn't hyperinflation. So you can achieve it without hyperinflation. The people who instead chose hyperinflation uh, had no, basically had no political choice. Uh, hyperinflation is where you take the pack of cards and throw them up in the air and see where they land because you've really got no other option. Uh, there are you know, There's fighting on the streets or your political regime is about to collapse and it's the very last thing you do. Uh, I wanted to read you something again from J.M. Keynes about why this is so unlikely to happen because I think he better than anybody diagnosed the risks of, of hyperinflation and why so few politicians would possibly, possibly choose it. Uh, and this is what Keynes said about hyperinflation. And you've got to think all of these solutions we're talking about, Brett, are political choices. Now, so we've got to think about, would a politician choose what Keynes is about to describe here? Uh, Lenin is said to have declared that the best way to destroy the capitalist system was to debauch the currency. So, I mean, Lenin thought hyperinflation would destroy capitalism. So, you know, you've got to You've got to think long and hard if that's the way you're going to go. By a continuing process of inflation, governments can confiscate secretly and unobserved an important part of the wealth of their citizens. By this method, they not only confiscate, but they confiscate arbitrarily. And while the process impoverishes many, it actually enriches some. 
The sight of this arbitrary rearrangement strikes not only at the security, but also at the confidence and the equity of the existing distribution of system. You know, you're going to destroy the system. You might say, well, why would anybody do it if you're going to destroy the system? Why did Venezuela do it? Why did Zimbabwe do it? Why did the former Yugoslavia do it? Because the political system was in such a mess that they threw all the cards up in the air and, and hoped that they might just land. But the important thing about Keynes is it's random. Wealth allocation is random in a scenario like that. He goes on to say, uh, Lenin was certainly right. There's no subtler, no surer means of overturning the existing basis of society than to debauch the currency. The process engages all the hidden forces of economic law on the side of destruction and does it in a manner which not one man in a million is able to diagnose. I think that's interesting, one man in a million. I think Keynes probably saw himself as, as the one man in a million. But, you know, this arbitrary re redistribution of wealth is fundamentally very dangerous. So it's a political choice which very, very few take, and I can't say that nobody will take it. Uh, <laughs> I look at the political structure of Turkey, for instance, and one does wonder uh, how that could go. But for the developed world, we have been here before, We've solved this problem before. We solved it with financial repression. That was very high levels of inflation, but way, way below uh, the uh, hyperinflation. So do you think it's likely that the US dollar will uh, enter hyperinflation based on the policies that we have or that, that will come? No, I don't think any of the developed worlds enter hyperinflation. I mean, I, I mean, we talked earlier about four to six, I could see it getting to 10, but no, I don't, I don't even see it getting back to where it was in the 70s. And so you think this plays out over decades, not a few years? Yeah, if, if the ultimate political goal is to reduce the debt to GDP ratio to levels that of debt that are sustainable, that are uh, robust where you don't constantly get crises, then if you could produce, let's pick a number, uh, growth in debt of 5% per annum, growth in nominal GDP of 10% per annum, then over 10 to 15 years, you'll get there. So note that the growth, note that the debt is growing. Uh, as it did after World War II. Uh, but you just have to get nominal GDP high and you hold it there for a long time. Nominal GDP at 10 is probably inflation at six or seven, not 50 or 60. And and that will achieve it. Now, obviously things can spin out of control and it can, you know, if velocity can go up, it can get to 15. I'm not saying that that wouldn't happen. Uh, but the idea that you get to hyperinflation is highly, highly unlikely. It's, uh, you'd have to see an, a, a political system on the verge of collapse and a politician in charge who just said, right, Let's roll the last dice. Let's go red 30 or let's go red 32. And that's possible, but really fairly improbable in a developed world. Well, Russell, you, you've laid out a very good case for why we have left the deflationary environment and have now at least started or, or are moving into the inflationary environment. And, you know, your, your, your calls over the last year have been, you know, as good as anybody's. Um, so congratulations. Let's talk just briefly about what could derail that, what what could happen that would cause it the inflationary thesis to roll back over in the deflation? We, we touched on China. Yeah. Um, I think the other two areas would be that banks don't lend money and then governments don't spend. But maybe we can just touch on those a little bit. Yeah, I think you've done my job for me then. The longer Xi holds on to the exchange rate, the slower, in my opinion, the slower growth in China will get. That will have an impact on, on global inflation because the Chinese demand will, will roll over. So I agree on that. And yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I talk this story on banks and I'm told all the time that it isn't going to happen, that governments won't get involved, that there isn't going to be a CapEx boom that demands bank credit. So it's a forecast, you know, and actually at the minute it's going at a reasonable clip, but it could roll over and that may not happen. Uh, I, I think the chances that governments don't spend, however, is pretty minimal, <laughs> given yeah. where we are today. So I think, I, so to me, it's those two big things that that uh, that really I would I would get wrong in this forecast. And the one that concerns me at the minute is clearly China. Uh, there is a hypothesis that she's doing this deliberately, and and he's the first politician to to buy into debt deflation since Andrew Mellon in 1930 famously said, "Liquidate stocks, liquidate capital, let the weak fold, let the strong hands take over." Uh, no democratically elected politician has said that since because it's uh, because of what happened after 1930. Uh, it, maybe Xi wants it, but I don't think he's going to pursue it for very long because the consequences for him, for the society of China and for financial stability are too great. But if I'm wrong on that, and actually he's still running this in a year from now because he kind of likes it, that all these private sector assets are coming into state hands, then you know I'm, I'm going to be wrong in inflation. It's going to come down uh, quite a bit quicker than I think it is. 
Well, I think, you know, I've, I've gotten the question in the last month and I've actually gotten it two or three times literally in the last week. And that is people will ask me because they know that in the long term, I think that inflation is going to happen for much of the reasons that you lay out. Like, I think you lay out the reasons perfectly. However, I, I'm a, there's a saying that, you know, it cannot be allowed to happen, so therefore it won't, won't happen. Mm-hmm. And I always say, just because something can't be allowed to happen doesn't mean it can't happen anyway. And so my, my thoughts are that to the things that we, we know China could cause it to, 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 to derail, um, the banks not lending, that could cause it to derail, and Congress not spending, that could cause it to derail. I think we both agree that Congress will spend money, and I think we both agree that Congress will mandate that the banks lend. However, I guess what I would say is that I think if I was playing devil's advocate, I would say they, the, the pain of, of, de, of a deflationary uh, spike or a deflationary impulse would grant them the power to then spend more or to force more bank lending. And I think we've a little bit seen this in the last month. You know, the Democrats wanted to spend three point five billion or trillion. You know, a year ago, everybody thought the Republicans would just say, yeah, spend whatever you want. Um, But now we're here. You know, they're fighting a little bit. And, you know, they had to kick the debt ceiling down a few months and the budget still isn't passed. And so I think it's possible that the that these government uh, apparatchiks, you know, who thinks that they have everything under control, maybe don't have everything under control as well as they do. That leads to the pain, but then that also leads to them giving cover to then come in and save the day. Yeah, well, I'm sure, like me, I'm sure, like me, you watched Congress trying to pass TARP one night, and the night they <laughs> I didn't. Pass, I do remember that. And the night they didn't pass TARP, and the screen had the Dow Jones Index as they didn't pass TARP. Yeah, and it was it three days later they passed TARP. You know, the market has a powerful way of disciplining politicians. I would say so. Uh, I wouldn't worry too much about politicians not spending money. I've, well, on that, I think you and I are in 100 percent agreement. But uh, in any case, I know we've kind of got to wrap this up uh, again. Thank you for your generous time. I think maybe what we do is why don't you tell again and we'll make sure the Real Vision puts the stuff up, but tell people how to find you again. Tell them about your your books, all this stuff. Yeah. So the course is something I'm really excited about. I've been running it for 16 years and finally we have this online version. So that put my name and course into Google. You'll find it. It's on the Didasco Education Company with a K, Didasco. Uh, and you can pre-register. We'll be launching in just a couple of weeks. So I'm excited about that. The book, uh, you, they used to say books are available at all good bookshops, but uh, now we can say it's available at one very famous online retailer and good bookshops. So not difficult to find if you put my name into uh, into that. And and, and, as, and as for these, there may be a few available on eBay, but I think I've bought most of them. There you go. There you go. Well, I, I will just say again that, you know, it's been a real pleasure. I would encourage anybody who watched the previous interview, watch this one now, you know, read Russell's books, follow him whenever he talks, listen, because, you know, he's not only a historian. I've said this before. He's a great storyteller. He does it in a way that allows you to to understand it. And uh, I think he has a, a pretty good grasp on uh, what's to come. In any case, thank you, Russell. Brent, thanks again. Best of luck. We all need a bit of luck. Absolutely.